All right, and we are live. Okay, so greetings, everybody. Welcome to uh, the show. Ah, yes, I had my thing covered up. Um, so top of the agenda is uh, Hawthorne. Hawthorne is out. Congratulations to us. Let us pat ourselves on the back. Woo! And to tell us all about Hawthorne will be the one, the only, the Ned. All right. Coming over here, right? Yep. Come on over. We're using this high-tech video technology yes. where we roll around in front of the cameras. Uh, so Hawthorne, uh, it's been a year in the making, which wasn't our original plan, but the Django uh, upgrade and then the GDPR foundational work um, were both things that had to get into Hawthorne. And so we waited until Hawthorne was done rather than just ship it on a calendar date when it wasn't done. Um, so we shipped Hawthorne Tuesday, I guess, was it? Yeah, yeah. Tuesday afternoon. Uh, so it's out there, Hawthorne.1. You should definitely install it and use it. We are still interested to know if it doesn't work for you. Um, there will eventually be a Hawthorne.2 with fixes to Hawthorne on it. There will not be new features in Hawthorne.2. So um, the code that's been going into master since um, July 3rd is after Hawthorne, and that will be available in the next OpenX release. Um, what else is there to say about Hawthorne? That's it, I guess. Yeah. It's great. You should use it. And if you have difficulty, ask questions in the usual places, and we'll see if we can uh, get something going. Right. I want to th thank the people that did install the beta. We had a beta back in early May, and we had a release candidate starting in July. And um, I think we got up, we released three different release candidates, numbered one, two, and four. Um, and thank you to everyone who tried installing it and got in touch with issues, made pull requests. Um, we tried very hard to get pull requests in at the last minute, even if they'd been moldering for a while in our review process. Not everything could get in. I apologize for that, but stability was more important than um, getting all the last minute requests in. Uh, so thank you to all of you who installed it and used it. And thank you to everyone who's been on Slack and the mailing list helping other people. We couldn't support the thousand different sites that run this software all by ourselves, so I really appreciate the people who have been out there helping, helping peers with what are difficult to diagnose problems online sometimes. So thanks a lot. Yeah, and if you filled out our survey saying that you installed the Hawthorne Release Candidate, uh, we will be sending you a lovely t-shirt. So, um, okay, now, but Hawthorne's out the door, fantastic. Now we're gonna talk about uh, what we want Ironwood to be, and really it's just kind of to say that, yes, we're working on Ironwood. Um, and the question is, the question I'll turn to the community is, what do you want Ironwood to be? Um, how do you want it to work? It's, we're trying to hit like basically a six month release cycle. So if you have ideas about Ironwood, uh, if you have things you've been working on that you want to see land in Ironwood, uh, now would be the time to talk about it and to make a proposal. Um, we have the OIP process, which is documented, um, but talk to us about what you'd like to see in Ironwood, and we can set up something either in the uh, Slack channel or someplace where we can start those discussions. I'll be looking to you uh, to let us know like how you'd like to see it work, uh, because otherwise it's just going to be the same thing as it usually is, which is uh, after six months, whatever uh, has made the cutoff, makes the cutoff, and we'll cut Ironwood from that. So if you want to see something specific in there that you're working on, um, let us know. And uh, yeah, and that'll be that'll be that. Um, okay, so next on the agenda, I think who, uh, Jeremy has so any one. questions or comments from people? Yeah, first. let me let me hang on for a second. If you have thoughts about Ironwood, now is the time to make them heard. Uh, otherwise, we're going to move to the agenda and we'll set up some time separately to talk about Ironwood on its own. Um, speaking of, well, I'll, I'll talk about that later. But uh, yes, no, nope. all right. Hold under your hats. Okay, um, I think uh, Jeremy is gonna have some uh, uh, updates on the Inker project. Hang on, uh, are you? Okay, sure, you can come around. <laughs> we'll play musical chairs here. Hello, so OEP 25 is on the verge of being approved. This is the incremental improvements project, which has uh, the Epic in there for upgrading edX platform to Python 3, and we're getting a few other projects started in there also. Uh, these are tickets that are intended to be good you know, starter tickets for people who are new to contributing to open edX, uh, for onboarding people who have just started working at a 
uh, company that does open edX development, or for just like little bite-sized tickets for people who have a little bit of time between projects and want to get something productive done. And this is going to be a fairly big project, so we need lots of people contributing. We've got a few of the tickets done and merged so far, but we could definitely use a lot more feedback and contributions from people. We've already gotten some good feedback on ways we can make it easier to get started on these. I'm going to be providing some updated documentation and update ticket descriptions accordingly. But please give it a shot, take a look at the list, pick something you want to try, and let us know how it goes. Cool. All right. Thanks. Oh, it looks, it looks to me like a meeting at AppSembler just ended. Yes, and now they're all coming on board. <laughs> Nate, come on, man. You got to plan your sprint meetings around these. Jeez. I, uh... <laughs> yeah, so um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to make sure we're not crushing each other's uh, sprint meetings next time. Say um, the Ironwood thing again. Yeah, oh, yeah. So now that AppSembler's here, I can talk about Ironwood again. Uh, yeah, so now officially marks the beginning of the Ironwood development period. Um, we're trying to go, we're going to try to hit a six month window. Um, if if you have ideas about things that you want to land in Ironwood, now is the time to bring them up. We have the OEP process. Uh, please use that. If you have major things that you want to contribute. Um, this is, and I, I I think what we'll need to do to really have this discussion proper properly is to have a separate discussion around Ironwood specifically, uh, which we can talk about, you know, soon-ish. Um, let me know when would be good for you, what you'd like to see, and let's try to get that kick started. Otherwise, you know, if we don't hear from you, we're just going to do what we usually do, which is uh, see what's available after six months, and then whatever makes the cut is what gets put into Ironwood. So, um, so yes, yeah, so let's actually have a discussion around that and do some planning. What a concept. Uh, okay, so there are a couple of announcements I want to make before we go into the show and tell portion uh, of today's uh, meeting. One is we've really started to get into the nitty gritty of planning for the 2019 conference. It's going to be March 26th to 29th in, at UC San Diego. And uh, it's actually in Vallejo, California, which is, or sorry, La Jolla, California, which is right next door to San Diego. Um, so we're starting to put together a sponsorship prospectus. We're starting to look at program committees. Some of you who are on the call will hear from me soon about uh, inviting you to be part of the program committee, which means you will have a hand in deciding the content uh, of, the, uh, of the conference. Um, so look for more information on that really soon. We're looking to officially launch uh, the call for papers and the conference by mid-September. So it's coming up very quickly and we'll be there before you know it. Uh, we'll have a placeholder web page up uh, probably in the next week or two. Uh, so that's one thing. Did you mention the dates? March 26th to 29th. So we're looking at, so in the past we've had kind of, like we've, we've said the conference is two days, but really it was four days because there was the tutorial day beforehand and then there was the uh, project day or what we're calling now the dev summit uh, the day after. But we're going to, we're going to look at this conference as an all-inclusive thing. It's, it's going to be four days, so plan to be there four days, um, Tuesday, March 26th through Friday, March 29th. Um, it's, going to be, it's going to change a bit how we're marketing it because we're, we're no longer talking about it as two days. We're talking about it as a, a four days, essentially a full week. So plan accordingly. Um, so that's the conference. A couple other things that are coming up. Uh, we have made some progress on getting a discourse site uh, that we're going to use uh, in a pilot experiment. We're going to be basically be using um, OpenCraft's uh, Ed Exchange site. Um, I'd really like to push that as a way to have discussions. I'm hoping to have that uh, fulfilled uh, by, by the end of this month. Um, ideally, uh, eventually, it would, it would be a replacement for a mailing list. I know I've been talking about this a lot, but I think it now is actually about to happen. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then finally, you know, just in general, um, Let's start talking about, now that we're starting to get into Ironwood planning, I would like to have an online mini dev summit in September where we talk about all the cool things that we're gonna be working on uh, that can hopefully go into Ironwood or what, uh, what our priority is going to be for the next six months. So I'll start shopping around some dates to have an online developer summit. Um, it would be great to have you know most of you on this call uh, also be there, uh, and as well as others too. So. Um, so those are the main things. 
Uh, before I move to the show and tell portion, are there any other things that anyone else wanted to talk about or mention or you had questions about uh, before we go to um, demos that we have people signed up for? Thoughts, questions? Suggestions? So where are we supposed to Can you register some stuff for um, Iron, Iron Wood? Amar, you're on mute. Um, yeah, um, I was saying, where are we supposed to, you can hear me? Hello? Can't hear you. Oh, your speakers. Oh, yes. Um, now? Are you on mute? Is your speaker on? Is your, if your speaker on? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, now talk. Um, hi. Okay, cool. Sorry, that was my fault. I didn't have my speaker no on. No okay, worries. go I'm ahead. Sorry, yeah. Uh, where are we supposed to log our ideas for Ireland and how do we know that they are committed and, and so we can allocate resources for it? Or, yeah, that's, that's so I think the right way to have them is to use the OEP process. Um, we can talk about ways to modify that to accommodate things like putting in uh, pieces for Ironwood. Uh, but to me, that's a starting point. Uh, just make sure that if you're going to propose something there, that you have, you know, that you know where the engineering resources are going to come from. If you're proposing something, the uh, assumption there is that you already have the engineering resources to implement what you're talking about. So that would be the only caveat um, I had there. Uh, but that's the place to start. And then once we have an idea of proposals or suggestions, um, then we can, you know, put those into the uh, developer summit that we're planning to have in, in September. So um, so I would say it's twofold. Uh, one is to write it down, and the second is to discuss it in a forum where we can make decisions about how we want to proceed. Does that sound fair? Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, awesome. Okay, so uh, because it's like the end of the summer, a lot of people are gone. Um, so I had thought a bit about maybe uh, canceling this one and just continuing in September, but I'm glad we did because we have two uh, brave souls who have ventured forth to uh, to give demos of things they wanted to show. Uh, one of whom uh, just asked a question. Omar, uh, do you want to you want to present uh, your screen, or how do you want to do this? Yeah, sure. One second. Okay. I like the name uh, Study House. That's a pretty cool, that's an appropriate name. It's, it is actually a study house. This is the most, the closest thing that I could find for a workspace. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> there are no, no much workspace out there. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to be posting the link here. So what I'm, do, what I'm showing here is two plugins. The first one is called Lingo X. Um, I use Duolingo a lot. And this this is a lingo because it's it's in short for a single language. So if you open this website, um, it's an open edX. It will open in Arabic by default, and that's intentional. And can you actually um, um, can you actually open it up and, and share it so we can all see what you're doing or, or no? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, so. If we open that website, it will open. Uh, I'm, I'm logged in, so I will open in, in whatever language that I use. Sorry. Um, do you see the Arabic site or the, the English one? The Arabic. Well, there's an Arabic course and an English course. Yeah, so I see the Arabic course on top and then the uh, edX demonstration course below it. Okay. I'll. Sorry. Okay, that's the one. I have two prompts. Okay. okay, yeah, sure. So um, I, this is incognito mode. I'm sure you know what that means. If you open it, you'll get the same experience. So this is a dual language site, okay, but it, it doesn't respect my browser language um, because there is a use case that's so common in, in people like me who are Arabic but uses um, English websites, uh, so, sorry, um, English browsers and English uh, operating system for a lot of reason. But I expect certain sites to open in Arabic by default, regardless of what my browser language is. And I don't expect myself to switch browser languages because they are not so easy. I don't know how to switch my browser language, actually. So uh, I want the site to be open in Arabic by default. This is the same case that 
um, applies for Edrock and pretty much every Arabic by default site that I use. And that plugin adds the support for it in, in, in Arabic. Um, sorry, in Open Index, I mean. So it's called Dingo X. Okay, and that's it's hosted in GitHub. Everyone can install it. And the links are available in, uh, in the uh, wiki page for, for today's uh, meetup. The other part of the, the other plugin, which is completely separate, is that we face a lot of issues with customers who are trying to log in by mistake and, and get locked um, as a consequence. So the only way to unlock a student account um, is by logging in into Shell and try to clean up somehow the um, memcache entry or cleaning up memcache altogether, which is bad. So what I've made is I made a unlocker plugin, okay, and that's it's gonna basically log the um, failed attempt here. You just gotta believe me for it because I didn't want to lock myself out of my server. So um, once you have an entry, you click and delete it like you did any other Django, um, Django admin thing, and the lock would be removed. This is, that's what the plugin is. And the other part is because OpenEdX has two-way locking mechanism, so if you get a student um, account-related lock, which what you get if you try to log in with the registration page, you would find it here. So what I did is basically added an admin panel for this because the, the model already exists. And what I did also is, uh, for the other one, there was no Django model. So I added the hook and created a Django model and exposed it in, into admin. So there's a little bit more work with the um, usual rate limit, limited thing that, that, that OpenEdX supports. And those are my two little plugins for OpenEdX. Okay. That's about it. So, so is that locking or blocking? You're blocking by IP address and one by account? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? So yeah, um, OpenEdX has two things. So if you try to log in with a known email, it will lock your account. Yeah. And, uh, but if you try to lock without a, without, with an incorrect email, with a lot of um, failed attempts, it will lock the IP altogether. Got it, okay. And so my plugin helps to remove those locks. Okay, great. Um, so I wasn't, I was not entirely clear on what the purpose of Lingo X is. It sounds like just so you can set the language uh, settings for the per user or, or so that the user can set them. Can you explain that a bit more? Sorry. Sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, so Django by default, whatever language, it, it has like, if, if you set up your, your Django in multiple languages, uh -huh. um, suppose English and Spanish, yeah. and Whatever language you use in your browser, like your browser UI, what does the browser use? Django will um, show the appropriate language based on that language. Okay. Yeah, the problem is, what if you don't want that? You want to enforce a default language and still enable the user to switch back if they don't like it. Got That's it. what like in allow. This is by default not available in Django uh -huh. and as a consequence not available in OpenEdX. Okay, excellent. Are, are these are both of these plugins something that you um, have thought about putting into the Friends of OpenEdX uh, organization on GitHub or or no? Um, no, I haven't contributed that. Okay. We, we can it's, talk about it later. <laughs> yeah, there are very old plugins that I've created back in 2014 and, and, and 15. So uh -huh. I'm exporting them instead of being like patched inside the platform. I'm making them something okay. uh, reusable for the community. Cool. Yeah, let's let's talk about how we can. Uh, have those maintained um, over time. Thank you. All right, thanks, Omar. Okay, and then, um, then we have one additional special guest uh, who is, I think it's uh, Bhagwati. Are you, Bhagwan, sorry. Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Great. Hi, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and, and what you'd like to, to show? Yeah, so can you give me the access? Uh, I think I think you can just share your screen. I don't have to give you access. I think you should be able to share your screen. Let me try. Okay.
si esto es así. Ah, there we go. Are you able to see the screen? Yes, I see your screen. I see your uh, presentation. Great. So, so just to give a quick background, I think everybody is familiar with adaptive learning. But uh, here, um, the idea is to use the Slack channel for uh, gathering the historical uh, information, profiles, preferences of the learners. And typically on the Slack, you have courses, uh, cohort groups, or uh, mentor groups, or uh, general channels, or random channels, where they discuss about the courses, whether it's a massive open online course, or within a, within a company, you have uh, uh, employees going through courses, or an online uh, course uh, management system or a learning management system where you have set up courses where uh, learners are taking it. So the agenda is simple. We talk about the NLP, we talk about sentiment analysis, and the open source project, which is Slack NLP, and a demo. And then uh, how, how, what are the next steps and uh, how it fits into open index. Okay. So I think you're all familiar with natural language processing, like typically, you use predictive analytics based on conversations and messages, extract the content from documents, exporting documents to different uh, formats, and also extracting critical information like entities and entity sentiments from profiles and conversations. So typically uh, in, in natural processing, what is this related to? What entities, what is similar, what is missing, and what will happen most of the time? And uh, let's say you have a sentence like John hit the ball and you have subject, object, and modifier. And um, you have various channels like Slack, social media, where the entity, entities are extracted, facts are discovered, entities are set to influence, and the text is mine. So if you see here, John is a subject and uh, hit is a verb, right? and you have a ball, which is a noun. Right? <coughs> and, uh, if you see on the right, you have various sentiments whether, let's say, the ball went really far, the shot was bad, right? And there was a problem with the shot. So you pretty much analyze the sentiments and also what are the entities here, the John and the ball, right? So that's the classic semantic analysis. So what is so special about Slack and LP is typically Slack has various channels and channels will have various messages from users and conversations and you have threads and replies, right? So the idea is to use that information for where the learners will describe, discuss about the courses and use that for adaptive learning when the course is being uh, rendered. We use that for capturing time to mastery, completion rates, or uh, the reading cap become complexity. Let's say the learner types in the Slack saying that this course is very tough for me to comprehend. I am unable to read. Language is very complex, right? Let's say, uh, the person is not completely uh, from uh, uh, an American I mean, English background. And the complexity of the content topics, like these topics are tough, these assignments are tough, these quotes, sub assignments uh, uh, or problems are really tough. Right? And, and you capture all the information related to a student, use that information for adaptive learning to make his learning experience smoother. From a technology point of view, we use Slack API, Google Cloud Language API, and Zango. And uh, this is the demo here. And uh, so this is the open source GitHub project where um, I have uh, the, given the detailed instructions. And uh, this is deployed on Heroku. Hey, uh, uh, Bhagavan, what are you trying to show right now? Because I think because you're still showing the um the uh, presentation screen. You may have to change what window you're sharing or just share your desktop entirely. Okay. Ah, there we go. Okay. So, you get okay. Your so is, yeah, sorry, go ahead. About, um, uh, and um, I'm going to log in. I have created a username. And um, so once you go to the home, you have various channels. And um, I hope you are able to see 
Slack window here. Yes, so we can this, see that. This is the workspace, developing workspace, Slack workspace where um, we have some users and there are some messages. So now we're going to apply the uh, NLP over this and let, let's say we go to the general channel. You see the messages from various users. Let's say you click on one of the user. Okay. So you have the username, Bhagwan Kumuddi, and uh, there are various threads and messages and associated sentiments. Let's say there are some threads. Okay. This is a more interesting scenario where there are a lot of conversations happening about jogging and whether it's good or bad. And you see the sentiments uh, flips from minus 0.6 to minus 0.5 and it's tough and bad. So this is a very simple scenario where we looked at um, a set of uh, channels and messages. And let's say you have courses and you have uh, mental groups and you have cohort groups and you have various users and uh, it almost becomes a big data problem. And uh, on the cloud, we have to have uh, you know, a scalable uh, architecture for this from a technology point of view. Right? So that's the brief uh, demo. Coming back, so what's next? So we have the basic NLP in place where we can look at the Slack channels, messages, and the sentiments. Now we want to create NLP for other channels. Let's say it's not just Slack, but let's say the communication channel is through uh, WhatsApp or messages. There are WhatsApp groups or Let's say they are Google groups. How do you go about getting those messages and using them for adaptive learning, right? And using NLP for that. So that's the next level features we are looking at. And some of the communication channels are like WhatsApp, Slack, Google groups, or uh, other groups which are, uh, uh, which are prevalent, and also social media, right? Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google uh, Plus, and uh, the other. Another one is interesting is the requirement like pass for Slack apps. Let's say you have multiple Slack uh, applications and you want to analyze NLP on various, you various uh, uh, Slack applications. You can pretty much create an application for a specific Slack app, create users for it. And the next level is currently I used Google natural language um, uh, processing here. But let's say you want to integrate Stanford or any other NLP API. How do you go about integrating that? And also a good dashboard analytics where we look at summary, more a summary rather than a drill down, where you look at the graphs, and look at the trends, look at uh, uh, the historical data, which is useful for course managers or uh, even for the, um, the administrators and the staff to see how the sentiments are across the, the Slack channels. And of course the course managers, you get into detail to understand specific adaptive learning uh, experiences. And the last, uh, how does this fit in OpenEdX? It can be a good add-on for uh, NLP, and especially in the education space. You have a Slack and various channels, uh, various Google groups used to discuss about the courses, to discuss about the learning management system, discuss about the course management system. So this will be a good add-on from a uh, AI point of view in NLP. To, to determine uh, how people feel about the course that they're participating in, or you know, is that kind of the basic idea? Right, and uh, it's not just fitting in, but also adapt the user learning experience by appropriately uh, uh, selecting the pace for the reader. And also the content has to be light for the particular student, right? So it's adapting the course content specifically to the learner. All right, I think, and Nate asked, uh, was the GitHub repo for Slack NLP shared? And yes, it is on the uh, agenda page uh, for Confluence, but uh, Bhagwan, if you could post it in the chat window, that would be most helpful. Sure, I'll do that. Cool, thank you. Excellent. Um, any questions for Bhagwan before we, uh, before we move on? Okay, excellent. Um, so two quick things. Uh, number one, we are in the midst of working on producing uh, a website 
um, or openedx.org. Uh, look for a beta or a staging a new website. A new website. A website. Yeah, sorry, a new website that replaces what is currently at openedx.org. Uh, look for that very shortly. Um, well, in, in a few weeks, look for a beta or a staging site of the new content. Um, it'd be great to get everyone's feedback on that uh, to see if we're hitting the mark. The idea is to to really to push OpenEdX as a platform. Um, that can be, you know, used and built upon by various members of our community. Um, and then, uh, and then I think if you guys have, there's anything you, anything else somebody wants to talk about as far as uh, the open mic portion of this. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to ask was whether or not this is the right time to have this uh, meeting, because um, I'm thinking specifically of APAC. People in you know China, Japan, India um, this is probably not a good time. I was actually thinking of moving it to like ten or eleven a.m. Eastern, which for our Pacific Coast friends would be like seven or eight a.m., which is probably not a great time. So we could alternate different times, but I'd be very interested in hearing what everyone thinks about um, the right time to have this. We may just have to have one um, have one at you know early and then one 12 hours time shifted 12 hours later uh, to accommodate kind of a global audience. But uh, I'm very interested in getting your feedback on that and hearing what you have to say so that we can uh, serve the community uh, uh, better. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, so I've, I've had different solutions to this, uh, some of which have involved having time zones that were terrible for everyone, <laughs> which is what I'd like to avoid. Uh, I've, I've had uh, situations where we time shifted uh, by 12 hours every other meeting so that um, you know, everyone gets a chance. I've had some communities where we would actually have the same meeting twice uh, 12 hours later um, to, uh, you know, to accommodate everyone. But um, I, think, uh, I think I'd like to, to hear what everyone else would, uh, has to think about that. Um, so let me know, either in Slack or uh, on the main list. So that's that. Um, okay, open mic. Uh, if there's anything that anyone would like to say, uh, now is the time to bring it up. Um, otherwise, we're gonna we're gonna close and uh, have this again, have this party again next month. Uh, anything anybody wants to bring up? Or things you'd like to see next month? Yeah, if there's anything you'd like to see from us next month, uh, this would be a good time to ask. So I have a question generally Go for um, it. I have been contributing for the platform for the past four years okay, okay. And I'm so happy that I've had so many contributions but I would like to know um, a little bit about what do you think about the capacity the processes of that that edX are dedicating to to open source because I, I do realize that um, edX as an organization is much much bigger than than, than the small open edX team and Superints are harder to align align between like us and and your team and so on like I'm not claiming that it's it's an easy thing to do, but I would like to know more about your view um, What do you um, How do you see the state the current uh, sta status of, of open source um, contributions um, like review process and, and capacity. I'm really more just about the capacity. Is it trending up? Is it trending down? And, and what do you would like to say about that? Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely trending up. Right now we are identifying uh, kind of the, the, the points of friction that prevent us from being more responsive. One of the directions I've given to engineering teams is that, you know, we don't have to accept every incoming contribution, especially if they're, you know, frankly not up to, you know, our criteria. But the thing I've directed them to be is more responsive, so that if we're not going to take something, to be more, to communicate more clearly, openly, and early uh, about, you know, our intent there, uh, just to be more responsive in general. And so uh, on the OpenEdX team, you know, we have Matt DeBos, uh, who's been very good as like a first line of defense, and the next step there is to get our engineering and product teams to provide reviews in a timely manner. We've been actively pushing on that, I think, for a really good 
couple of months, uh, especially after we got back from Montreal. Uh, and that's something that um, we've certainly been uh, pushing for. And we now have a dashboard where we can track our, um, our response times. And we're in the process of publishing those live on these video screens outside of our room so that everyone can see you know, how we're doing as far as um, our response time. So this is definitely an ongoing area where we are continuing to monitor and to do what we can. The, the, um, the, the investment in the OpenX community is definitely increasing. Um, you know, one of the problems though, of course, is that after five years of what I would characterize as benign neglect, uh, it takes time to overcome kind of these systemic issues that we've had. Um, and so on one hand, I ask patients, on the other hand, uh, you know, I, I think as we kind of work together to provide solutions here, you know, I don't actually want you guys to be too patient. I want you guys making noise and telling us what we're doing wrong uh, because I can tell you the squeaky wheel gets the grease. <laughs> so, um, you know, let's, let's figure out how we can do this together. Uh, but, but as far as investment from, from edX, I can tell you it's definitely increasing. Uh, I mean, does that, I mean, I know that the proof's in the pudding, right? You're, I can say whatever I want, but until you actually see the response times decrease and people paying attention to your contributions, you know, that's going to be the proof of whatever we say. So um, I'm, the, I'm really interested in the graph that, that you were talking about. I know I can go to GitHub and then extract that graph, but um, I don't feel like this is a like in, in investment from, from I, I feel that I should focus like I said, on, on my contributions. But yeah, sure, this, this would be really a great thing. And I would really want to check that graph and see um, why some record requests are like, we're gonna, getting we're gonna tried. Publish, we're going to publish that graph live on the website so that everyone else can see it too, because I think uh, sunlight is a great disinfectant in this case. Um, so, and it's kind of, it's very appropriate that you're bringing this up now because uh, we just had a meeting today about this very topic, uh, how we can uh, be better uh, in this process. So there's, there are a lot of top people <laughs> uh, thinking about these very issues and how we can um, you know, build a better uh, developer community. So we're going to continue having meetings. One of the things that, and, so just so you know, one of the things I'm trying to do at this meeting is pushing our engineers to be more engaged with you guys and to see you know, what you're doing so that they can actually, um, we can have bi-directional sharing. That, that is kind of like the number one impetus behind this community hangout. Um, Nate had a comment about you know, maybe not doing this, maybe sending out uh, notices of this meeting in further advance. Uh, although I can tell you, I have a monthly recurring calendar invite for edX engineering internally so that um, they know about this meeting uh, well in advance. My apologies for thinking that having the invite on my calendar meant that was also in your calendars. So I need to correct that and make sure that you guys are also uh, on the invite list uh, for this as well so that um, this doesn't you know, keep happening and that we can get everyone on regular cadence because you know, we have scheduled it. We have allocated time for the second Thursday of every month. Um, so I can, in fact, uh, in September, I can tell you the date will be, uh, when will the date be in September? I, I don't know. I don't have my calendar open. If I did, I would tell you. Um, <laughs> hang on a second. So the 13th. September 13th will be the, uh, will be the next one. Um, I'm actually going to be in California for that one. So that will be, that will be fun. Uh, but anyway, but that's the, but yeah, expect second Thursday every month. I'll put on a calendar so that everyone can see it. And, uh, and that way we don't run into, uh, AppSembler's, uh, sprint meetings. So apologies. All right. Um, all right. Is it, uh, is that, Amar, is that, is that as much as we can, you know, respond at this point or is there more um yeah sure this is much better than than, than um sitting on the other end of the world and wondering what's happening because yeah I, I mean i i would like to look at trends and having 300 open per request in the open index repository doesn't 
make it easy for me to to scroll them manually. So yeah, yeah. I'd rather um, would be much much better. So. The the other thing is, and we're looking for a couple of particular projects. We're looking at delegating uh, merge responsibilities to to others. Um, there are one or two people we have in mind uh, for that role. So uh, keep your eyes open because we're we we recognize that there are some areas of the code base that uh, actually, and this pertains to the conversation, the governance conversation we had in Montreal about there's some areas of code base that frankly are not that um, not in use very much for edX.org and things that we can delegate responsibility for um, with minimal risk. And we're actually looking to do that um, as I speak. So uh, hopefully that will help in somewhat, but it's not, you know, then we'll get to the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem is uh, dedicating more resources from our engineering team to making sure that we have um, better responses. So. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Anything else for the uh, open mic period? Oh, I got to see Mr. Baldwin with his hand. All right. So going back to, um, you mentioned that, you know, there's a, a number of, um, uh, upstream uh, requests that are rejected? Some, actually not as many as I would like. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of, uh, well, we, so we're calling these um, contributed pull requests now. Uh, I call it okay. CPR because everyone needs to learn CPR. Uh, but, uh, so a lot of those, they're not rejected. A lot of those just sit. And what I'm trying to push people to do is not sit on it, but to respond in some way. So. They end up being rejected by default just because we don't actually respond or in some cases the authors don't respond to us but it actually um, in both cases there are communication issues uh, but so yeah so to your comment I would I would just say that I would like to see more rejections because at least that would be something tangible that we say uh, that we could act on uh, okay. which is different from what we do in a lot of cases which is where we don't reject and, and don't respond at all Okay, thank you, John Mark. Uh, thing I was thinking about with that, uh, that's helpful to, to learn that. Uh, the thing I was thinking about with that is understanding, you know, are there any common themes with um, the CPRs that would be rejected that would help lend toward um, um, shaping edX platform as a more pluggable architecture? I mean, that, that is definitely, and Namisha's on vacation, and she, or otherwise she would be here and would respond to that. Um, but that's, that is the thrust of all of her work, is making the OpenEdX core a uh, more pluggable architecture uh, to enable exactly what you're talking about. Um, because we realize that if we're really going to have a dynamic ecosystem here, we're going to have to make it easier for people to plug into um, APIs, which means that we're going to have to architects you know, the platform to be more, you know, API friendly and that sort of thing. So that is definitely a top of mind. If you have ideas about that, uh, Namisha is definitely the right person to be in contact with. Um, and frankly, the, uh, the architecture team has done a really good job of having the conversations on our public Slack channel. Now I would invite you to uh, participate in those and, you know, see what's up there. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll, I'll make a note of that to follow up with her on that. Cool. Excellent. All right. Um, anything else at the moment? And as soon as we get done here, I'll have to make sure to uh, make sure we have like the recurring invites uh, heading out uh, to the community uh, uh, earlier so that we don't get schedule congestion. All right. Uh, anything else? Excellent. Okay. Uh, enjoy the rest of your summers, and we'll uh, we'll talk again in September. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.